Welcome to another episode of Living with FASD. My name is Patty Casper. I'm your host, and I bring to this conversation both professional and living experience with brain injuries caused by prenatal exposure to alcohol. So this is a informational and human interest show geared for those living with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, their family and loved ones, and anyone else wanting to learn more. So this week, we are diving into a new topic, and it is FASD and sleep apnea. So I bring Jared Brown, Dr. Brown, back to the mic to talk about yet this, this other area that it impacts every aspect of our lives. Welcome back to the show, Jared. Hi, Patty. Thanks for having me. Honored to be here. I'm glad we're talking about this topic because if my memory serves me correctly, we've done two other episodes on sleep disorders in general. We did a two-part. Yeah, we yeah. did a two-part series and, and it came out on Christmas Day. What, what better time? <laughs> what better time? <laughs> When the parents no, are like, oh, I need sleep. And the kids are like, sleep? Who cares? We got toys. Exactly. I know. <laughs> this is probably a topic that folks in the FASD world maybe don't think about that much. And in my world, I do a lot of work in the area of sleep because it intersects with everything and memory and behavior and substance use and Alzheimer's and autism. The list goes on and on and on. But there is actually research in the FASD literature that does talk about sleep disordered breathing, sleep apnea, and snoring. Not a lot, but there are sprinkles of it out there. So it is something to be aware of. We know, we, I'm sure if you're listening to this, you know someone who's impacted by sleep apnea or snoring. We all do. I, I have a million I, family I've never and heard friends. myself snore. I don't do that. I have sleep apnea. People are surprised to learn that. It's I do too, very strange. actually. Yeah, <laughs> very, very common. And I only found out because I went to my dentist and she said, did you suck your thumb as a kid? The way the teeth formed in my mouth around my thumb sucking caused me not to get as much oxygen in. So, so just something to think about. We'll, we'll talk about a lot of things today. But when you think of, Patty, when you think of sleep apnea, like everything, it's on a spectrum, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's referred to as the spectrum of sleep disordered breathing. So on one side of the spectrum, you have snoring. On the extreme side of the spectrum, you have obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Again, we're not giving medical advice here. Talk to your doctor. But if you look at the research literature, I'll sprinkle in a few nuggets here. Why in the world should you care about snoring? Well, in the ADHD literature and in the conduct disorder literature, it does talk about if you're working with young kids who have a lot of behavioral or attention problems before jumping to the conclusion and diagnosing them with one of those disorders, has anyone ever referred them to a doctor for a sleep specialist? And there's some evidence to support if you can clear up the snoring mm -hmm. and the sleep issues some of those symptoms that mimic ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder mm -hmm. may go down. So I remember just something to think saying about. that in December. Yeah. Did I? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So definitely just something to be aware of and sleep impacts everything. So just and, be and aware the, of that. And the good news now with sleep studies is you don't have to go to a center and sleep in a room all wired up with a glass window and a stranger watching you. Yeah, yeah. And right. When I had my first sleep study, that was the deal. And it's really hard to sleep when you're self-conscious. Just sure. saying. Uh, but now yeah, what happens if someone had a history a of trauma? Yeah. yeah, think about trauma history, social anxiety. I mean, those yeah. can be barriers for folks. Yeah. So yeah, that's beautiful. So, and so now they, they give you um, a minimalistic um hook up in terms of wires right um carried in a in a belly band so you don't have to worry about things falling off and and you just in your own bed at home and then you drop everything off 
to be evaluated afterwards. So it's yes. um, it's amazing what technology is doing, and I can't imagine what will be five, ten years from now. I mean, it's yeah. it's ever growing. So sleep apnea, big topic, like them all. You'll find thousands of studies on it with in general, but. Most folks have probably heard of obstructive sleep apnea. That's going to be the more common form. And that might be where the airflow in the mouth or the nose isn't getting in properly. And maybe someone's had a broken nose history. Maybe their tongue is very large. Maybe they're really obese. I mean, there's a million causes. There's also central sleep apnea. And that's where kind of the communication in the brain and the signals that are sent to the muscles that control breathing are off. So that, that's a different ball game. We're not talking about that per se today. It's more the obstructive kind of sleep apnea, but yeah, that, the that's symptoms... the type of apnea that I worry about with my mom, right? Because Lewy body dementia messes with the autonomic nervous system, which sure. is what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, you know, definitely. A man to breathe kind of an important one. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. Oxygen getting the proper amount of oxygen mm -hmm. and learning how to breathe properly during the day mm -hmm. makes a world of difference in all kinds of things. So yeah. now we all probably know like the basic symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, but obstruction of the upper airway, mm -hmm. you have reduced blood oxygen saturation. So you're not getting as much oxygen in the blood over activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So you're kind of in that fight or flight response sometimes, and you're having those micro awakenings. That's very hard on the heart and the other parts of the body. And if that goes on and on and on year after year, this is a major threat to human health so in a you lot say, of different ways. You say micro awakening. So that's when you're sleeping but part of you rises up, your wakefulness rises up a little bit, not enough to cognitively wake. Yeah, you might have like, you're not getting the oxygen and then you gasp for air every 10 seconds, 30 seconds. And mm -hmm. th there's mild, moderate, severe kinds of sleep apnea. So that's why testing is so important, working with your healthcare provider. Research shows too that people with untreated sleep apnea don't get into REM sleep as much. So you're not getting as much restorative sleep, even though maybe you're in bed eight or nine hours, you're not getting that deep restorative sleep. And why should you care about that? And because if you're not getting deep restorative sleep, there's actually a part of the brain that researchers found in the last decade or so where there's like a neural plumbing system. You get deep, deep sleep, your brain is being cleansed of all the neurotoxic buildup. And you, you, we talk about dementia, Alzheimer's a little bit. You'll find lots of research that shows there's a connection between that many years prior. So it is a big thing. And and I know that's, it, again, going to the Lewy, that's one of the earliest telltale signs for Lewy body dementia is uh, disturbed REM sleep. Where, you know, when we are in REM sleep, our body is basically paralyzed. It keeps it keeps our dreams in two dimensions, right? And <laughs> when that's out of whack, then we act out our dreams and, um, you know, we can, we can beat up our partner <laughs> or we can have all or bad accidents, whatever. But I'm also thinking about, you know, that is a very important, there's a huge difference between sleep and rest that a lot of people don't appreciate, right? To, to your point. But that's also one of the other things that happens when we are in that deep sleep is our memories go from the short-term memory bank over to the long-term memory bank. A huge factor right? of memory, cognition, yeah. learning, attention, executive function, oh, the list goes on. So we all know folks with FASD are dealing with all of those factors usually. This just makes it worse. So... Brain, brain, I, get the sleep under control. It can help reduce secondary symptoms. It's not going to cure it, but it'll make it more manageable. I, I can't remember where I picked this up, but I, it was something that I learned probably a few decades ago, that if you're someone that finds yourself driving an automatic pilot, you know, and, and, and we all joke about this, like all of a sudden we're home and it's like, wow, where'd those miles disappear? Right. 
um, if we are, the more we are driving an automatic pilot, the more we need to be looking at the quality of our sleep and yeah. looking at excessive sleep daytime sleepiness is a yeah. risk factor for accidents, car accidents. You look at some of the major catastrophes mm -hmm. in our country's history. I'm not going to name them, but there's a few of them that they directly linked to sleep issues, not necessarily sleep apnea, but just chronic sleep deprivation where we are not thinking as clearly. We have reduced error awareness. I mean, we're just more clumsy and big, big thing. And sleep apnea causes lots of issues during the day with fatigue. I mean, that's a, a symptom, of course, and a lot of other symptoms to take into account as well. So yeah. when I give talks on uh, sleep issues, especially like sleep apnea, sometimes a question always comes up. What are the causes for this? What are the contributing factors for obstructive sleep apnea? And it's different for everyone. That's another reason why you want to consult with your medical doctor who's an expert in this area. But a narrow throat is a factor in some cases. Mm -hmm. Thyroid issues, hypothyroidism has been talked about as a potential contributing factor. Allergies, getting allergies treated can be very helpful. Having a deviated septum. So if you played sports or have ever been in an accident or gotten into fights and broke your nose here and there, that could be a factor as well. Mm -hmm. Smoking cigarettes. We know that that's not good for health, of course. Alcohol and drug use are contributing factors. The weight of someone, excessive weight gain can be a factor. Being male, you're at greater risk. Being older, you're at greater risk. Having a family history, you're at greater risk. If you're taking certain kinds of medications, talk to your doctor again, certain kinds of medications, like sedatives, things like that, could actually impact the muscles and, and, and be a factor. But again, talk to your doctor. If you have a lot of nasal congestion, besides like allergies, I mean, there's a million reasons for that. Could it be food sensitivities? Could you be living in a home where there's mold? Yeah. or there's a lot of mildew or just the temperature, it's really musky. Yeah. There's a lot of things we can do to probably improve this, but going through the healthcare provider first, getting a proper diagnosis, and then finding out what the best treatment options are. And there's a lot of treatment options out there. We know that like the CPAP is the gold standard, but there's there's all kinds of other ones out there. We'll talk about some interventions as well. So Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that really... And, and I know with CPAP, there's a couple different mechanisms. There's the full face mask. And then there's also just the cannula or the, the smaller nose version yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people who have um, sensitivities, yeah. right? The yeah. sensory mm -hmm. issues Absolutely. Um, don't do well with either one of those no. mechanical mechanisms. So how much do you know about some of these other more modern um, interventions? Can we talk about interventions at the end? There's a few more foundational things sure. I want to just lay down just so we, we know the bad stuff first. Then what, what do we do about it? Yeah. Symptoms of sleep, obstructive sleep apnea again, all over the map. And waking up with a headache in the morning, being apathetic, fatigue, just having like dry mouth or having an unusual taste in your mouth. You'll hear that sometimes as well. I mean, there's many, many more as well. But when we think about this, think of sleep fragmentation, think of just daytime fatigue, even anhedonia, this increases the risk of anxiety, depression, mood related problems. The list goes on. And a lot of times when people have obstructive sleep apnea, they're going to have insomnia as well. And insomnia is a full other kind of disorder or a symptom, but sleep apnea and insomnia share a lot of traits as well. Frequent awakenings, mm -hmm. having a hard time falling asleep, your excessive daytime sleepiness, and it can contribute to a lot of social dysfunction and occupational dysfunction. People with these issues are much more likely to call in sick to work, have difficulty accomplishing their school goals. They're more prone to accidents and it can absolutely decrease their quality of life. So 
a lot of times when people have these kinds of issues, it's not just one thing going on. It could be a multitude of factors. And again, maybe it's behavioral, maybe it's structural, maybe it's environmental. It's probably the combination and what we eat as well plays a lot to do with this kind of stuff. So Jared, what is the connection between sleep apnea and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders? Not a lot of literature out there, but there, there's a few studies again. And if you want, I can definitely send you some links you could share with your audience. Mm -hmm. But we know that the overwhelming majority of people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have sleep issues in general. The research shows mm -hmm. problems falling asleep are reported to be much higher, more nighttime awakenings, nightmares are more common. You may see as a parent your child with FASD has a lot of bedtime resistance. Mm. Could be a lot of reasons for that. Maybe you're an adoptive parent. And unfortunately, maybe that child came out of foster care or a lot of horrific trauma. So night anxiety and then parasomnias have been known to be higher in people with FASD. So parasomnia being? Could, could be sleep talking, night terrors, bedwetting. Parasomnias are a type of sleep disorder that happen right as someone's going to bed during sleep or right when they wake up. And there's a lot of different parasomnias out there. So the studies on prenatal alcohol exposure have shown that in utero exposure to alcohol may suppress fetal breathing movements. There's a couple studies on that. So in utero, obviously these things are causing issues in the brain, prefrontal cortex the HPA access, all the things we've talked about in other segments. The studies that have been done on this, they're smaller sample sizes, but what they have found that the folks with FASD compared to the control group had more mild sleep disorder breathing kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. So more breathing movement disruptions, breathing irregularities, it could be full-blown obstructive sleep apnea. It could be snoring. But working with professionals who can detect this, diagnose it, and then get the proper interventions in place, it's one less issue that the person with FASD is dealing with, which may make a huge difference yeah. Yeah, in bringing sure. down some behavioral problems and secondary issues and yeah. even the impact this has on executive function. If someone is not sleeping well, they're not getting proper oxygen, they're not breathing properly, and they already have underlying executive function impairments. Again, it's just pouring fuel on the fire. It just yeah. grows it. So I, I, one thing we know is that our sleep-wake cycle is formed in the womb before we're born. It, could that be one of the mechanisms by which prenatal exposure to alcohol sets us up? When you study that topic, you will want to be aware of a few terms. You want to be aware of circadian rhythm misalignment mm -hmm. and the SCN, the supercatismatic nucleus. I hope I'm not butchering that. <laughs> That's kind of the central command center of our circadian rhythms. And the FASD literature does talk about prenatal alcohol exposure can impact that part of the brain. And there is some evidence too that prenatal alcohol exposure can also impact melatonin secretion in the brain. So this is more sleep in general, maybe not just specific to sleep apnea, but those are a few reasons why folks with FASD typically have significantly higher rates of sleep related issues compared to the general population. Mm -hmm. And that inability to self-soothe is another factor that frequently comes up. So yeah. if that person with FASD can't self-soothe and they get really irritated and things just don't go their way and they just explode and fly off the handle. What better way to disrupt your sleep than to be dealing with high levels of anger and irritability? Mm -hmm. Learning self-soothing skills is a frontline intervention. There's a lot of other ones, but that would be very helpful as well. Yeah. I can yeah. give you tips and strategies now if you want. Please or... do. Some of these are not FASD specific. It's more in general yeah. because here's a call to action to researchers, students. 
what interventions would be most effective for someone with FASD who has sleep disordered breathing? Does the general literature apply to folks with FASD with all the comorbidities? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But in the insomnia literature, there's a really nice model that you might want to write down if you're interested in just different things to be aware of that can contribute to insomnia. The three key model of insomnia, that would be something you'd want to look into. There's a Dr. Spielman who developed this model, and it's broken down into predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetrating factors that are just making this grow. So if you can understand that model, that would be something you want to look at. Mm -hmm. If you're a clinician and you, you have the proper credentials, there's actually several screening tools in the research literature for obstructive sleep apnea. The Berlin questionnaire is one, the Stop Bang questionnaire is another, and the OSA 50 questionnaire is another. Screening tools are not diagnostic, like you can't give a screening tool and say this person has sleep apnea, but the screening tool opens the door to conversation and maybe referrals to the healthcare provider mm -hmm. to dig deeper and deeper in, into these and kind of things. And could definitely be helpful in getting insurance to pay for testing. That, let's hope. Yeah, let's hope so. So, <laughs> so when we think of like starting to target this from maybe an FASD lens or a neurodevelopmental disorder lens, a couple things to ask yourself. How is the, if the person does have sleep apnea and you know they have it, they've been diagnosed, how is this impacting their mood and behavior? What has happened after the diagnosis and before? If you're getting treated, are you noticing a decrease? Mm -hmm. Cognitive deficits, obviously, frontline kind of deficit in folks with FASD. Are you noticing any changes since the client has gotten diagnosed with sleep apnea and they're starting to re receive treatment? Are you noticing that they're retaining just a little bit more information? Do they seem to not get as dysregulated as much? Just some things to be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. Irritability and undiagnosed sleep apnea go hand in hand. Be on the lookout for that. And when we think about treatment in general, if you look at the general medical literature, there's we talked about the CPAP machine, kind of gold standard. But again, there's a lot of people I know that have the CPAP. They use it one time and they just... They never use it again. Yeah. yeah. There's oral appliance therapy. You can look into that with your doctor. Sometimes dentists will look into that. That that's so something. Is that have something to that she keeps your jaws aligned in such a way to maximize airflow? Is is that yeah, I'm not an expert in that, but I know like some dentists specialize in that and they can like measure the inside of your mouth and then they can develop it, whatever company they go with can develop the oral appliance specific to the way your jaw lines. And I've heard wonderful things about it. I've heard difficult things about it. Like all these things, not, none of it is going to be perfect for each one, but right. practical things from just a behavioral lens, from a, just what can we do to help maybe reduce this? If you look at the research literature, lose weight. If, if someone's overweight, weight reduction, mm -hmm. looking at lifestyle changes, behavioral modifications. If, if someone smokes cigarettes, mm -hmm. quit smoking. I know how hard that is from what I hear from clients, but getting rid of tobacco, very, very important. If someone has a tendency to consume alcohol, and maybe there's no problem with alcohol in their life, but they're consuming a glass here and there. Are they consuming the alcohol right before bedtime? Something to look at too. I'm not promoting alcohol use, but just looking at alcohol intake. When are you doing it? Look at your food intake. Work with a nutritionist. There are multiple research studies that talk about different supplementation and different kinds of dietary patterns that can be helpful and not helpful. Unhelpful dietary patterns we talked about briefly. If you're one to eat a lot of fast food, you microwave your food all the time. It comes in a package and there's a million ingredients in there you don't know how to pronounce. 
that's probably not good for your body, which then triggers inflammation. So looking at this through an infl inflammation reduction lens, very helpful. Mediterranean diet's been talked about, plant-based foods. But again, I'm not, don't take this and run with it. it everyone is wired differently. Yeah. We had a segment, Patty, too, I believe, on the gut and the gut-brain access. Obstructive sleep apnea, undiagnosed, untreated, has been linked to more gut dysbiosis, so gut problems. So that's another huge can of worms to be aware of. That's a very interesting link. Yeah, it, it makes sense because if you're not getting restorative sleep, your inflammation's higher, your hormones are off, mm -hmm. and maybe you're stress eating during the day and you're so fatigued. What do a lot of people do who are just so tired? Energy drinks, tons of caffeine, sure. lots of sugar. The list goes on and on and on. We've all heard of sleep hygiene practice. Of better. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. So I, I think definitely what you do when you wake up and what you put into your body through the day impacts the sleep the next night without a doubt so yeah. do you want me to go into sleep hygiene practices a little bit sure. i know we talked about that some in the other one but sure when you think of sleep hygiene again anything we can do to optimize our sleep health our thinking our bedroom look around your bedroom what's going on in your bedroom that may be good for sleep or bad for sleep what kind of movement do you get through the day? Are you one to live a sedentary lifestyle or do you try to get out for some walks or do yoga or lift weights? Again, talk to an exercise specialist before doing anything like that. What are your behaviors about sleep? Again, maybe there's a trauma history and you have a deep fear of the bedroom mm -hmm. or the dark. And for children coming out of foster care, there's a whole line of literature that talks about just being aware of nighttime anxiety around sleep. And being aware to smoking habits, yeah. caffeine intake, sugar intake, technology use habits, yeah. drinking habits, not just, I'm not talking alcohol too, but are you one to pound down the water right before bed? And then you're waking up two, three times a night, having to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Those are a few things to consider. And then one thing we didn't really talk about today too that is an issue that comes up a lot when I consult on cases is, is pain. Mm -hmm. Is the person dealing with any pain issues? Could be joint pain, arthritis. Yeah. Maybe it's a history of traumatic brain injury and migraine headaches, things like that. So I, those are I a know lot for, of for me, that's the falling asleep is the difficult piece yeah. because I've, I have several chronic pain conditions. Um, one is from arthritis um, another is degenerative disc disease in my back. Um, third is diabetic uh, neuropathy. Um, when that gets triggered, my limbs feel like they're on fire from the inside out. Um, thankfully that I, I don't get triggered like I used to, but when I'm busy during the day, if I can keep my mind occupied, I can completely ignore the pain and I'm fine. And I've long said that sleep is the best narcotic. The hard part is the falling asleep piece in the middle. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. And there's because not a that's magic. That's what it's like all those nerves mm -hmm. are saying, hello, we're here. Nothing's changed. We hurt. Right. And, and the mind, if we busy our mind to ignore it, then we put off falling asleep. What you're saying, Patty, reminds me of that first episode we did together. I would encourage folks to go back and listen to it. It was on psychoneuroimmunology. Mm -hmm. It's the connection between our thinking, our body. It's kind of a mind-body spectrum field where our thinking impacts our mood, our mood impacts our thinking, our mood impacts our eating habits, our exercise. It's all interconnected. And at the core of that, it really talks about getting your inflammation down in the body, which can be very helpful for all kinds of things, including pain management, mm -hmm. depression management, the list goes on and on. So that field of study, I encourage you, if you want to learn more about the interconnectedness between our thinking and bodies, check that out, psychoneuroimmunology. Yeah. And I think that was from, I want to say the end of summer last year. Your memory is better than mine. I, I, 
don't know. <laughs> well, I started in June, so it had to have been sometime probably in July, July okay. or August. Okay. Yeah. Patty, are there any other areas you want me to share with the folks just from the sleep apnea lens that could be helpful? Um, I... I think that's I think that's pretty good. So I know when I post these on YouTube, um, there's a way for me to tag a few prior episodes. So I will I will tag the neuro the psychoneuroimmunology one, and then the first of the two sleep ones, um, with the caveat for folks that listen to the one that came out on Christmas Day, part two was the same day. So just watch the very next one when you're done with it. Um, and then that'll that'll get all three of those episodes. Patty, I'll just leave folks with this, that this is my opinion, sleep is medicine. And we all know how we feel if we miss a night of sleep oh. or two or three. I mean, I can't imagine yeah. being up for three nights in a row. I've never had that happen, but yeah. and the it older doesn't we matter. Get, the harder it is to recover. Yeah, it takes longer and longer. And, you know, it doesn't matter the diagnosis. If it's FASD, if it's depression, if it's just conflict you're having, a better night's sleep mm. helps. It's not going to cure FASD. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But it's going to make it more manageable. Yeah. Those secondary symptoms will hopefully be more manageable. The person will be in a better state instead of them getting irritated really quickly or flying off the handle. Maybe it buys you a little more time to redirect yeah. the person. and It lengthens but, that fuse. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great analogy. And look at this as part of a comprehensive intervention approach to helping folks with FASD. And in an ideal world, my opinion, you know, having your case manager, your therapist, your psychiatrist, all those good folks, but having a sleep specialist part of it, having a nutritionist, having an exercise specialist, Mm -hmm. makes it more holistic and I think it can lead to better outcomes I really do yeah oh Jared thank you for raising this topic um welcome yeah you you always bring us good things to talk about I know we're going to be talking in the future I think you and I chatted one on uh, migraines there's actually a little literature on FASD and migraines and oh. then I think we're doing the next one I, we discussed on false confessions. So we're taking a detour yes. back into the forensic criminal justice realm, where that's where my most of my experience is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're, it's so important. There's many moving parts with FASD. And the more we can understand these moving parts, I think we'll be able to put together the complex puzzle right. that can help the person thrive. Right. All right. So you mentioned alcohol use. And so that was a, a really good segue into <laughs> my sponsor. Um, Living with FASD podcast is now sponsored in part by Curious Elixirs, because uh, a lot of us affected by FASD would rather enjoy booze-free beverages. And Curious Elixirs was voted the number one uh, best non-alcoholic drink four years in a row by the New York Times. Um, and of course, everybody's preferences are different. Some like the, the super sugary beverages and, and others less so. Um, but Curious Elixirs are infused with organic plant-based adaptogens or mood boosters that benefit your body. They're booze-free craft cocktails that are bold, fun, refreshing with no artificial or synthetic flavors. Um, they, if there is a sweeter cocktail, I haven't found it yet. Um, and I, I was more of a, a sweet cocktail kind of girl. Um, but the adaptogens are going to meet your needs, whether it's a week night or a weekend, without the harmful or toxic effects of alcohol. And they even come with recommendations for garnishes. Who knew? So if you are on a journey away from alcohol or um, merely searching for a sophisticated alternative to tea or carbonated beverages, and of course, Jared, we're going to agree, carbonated beverages, 
Yeah, there, there is no nutritious value whatsoever. Um, but if you're on a search for an alternative beverage, then use the affiliate link in the show notes and that will benefit the Living with FASD podcast. So um, now that that is a little announcement is made, if you if folks watching or listening want to join the community, hop on over to patreon.com slash living with FASD podcast. And of course, you can join the community for free, just like the podcast itself will always be free. But there is also a paid membership level at either the five, 10 or $15 a month level. Um, and even $15 a, a month is cheaper than the price of one weekly cup of coffee. Um, but all those monies come and help me pay for the programs that I use to bring you this good content week after week after week. So any support is appreciated. I want to thank everybody for their time, whether you're taking us along with you on a bike ride or a car drive, or whether you're just chilling at home or keep letting us keep you company as you clean the house, whatever it is that you're doing. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Living with FASD. And I hope you have a fantastic week and we'll see you next Monday for another episode of Living with FASD. Jared, my friend, thank you again. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.